Hello and welcome to Let's Start Playing. Today I'm going to be teaching you Terra Mystica, one of my favourite games. I have this loaded up and ready to play for two players, however the recommended player count is four for this game. Terra Mystica is a game of growing cities, terraforming lands, creating towns and going up in cult tracks. Let's go over the ways that you can score victory points in this game. So there are three ways of scoring that will be consistent across all your games. These are area scoring. So this is the player with the largest connected cities and towns will score 18 points. The second player will score 12 and the third player will score 6. Also with the cult tracks, which are these tracks up the side here. The player who has a higher score on each cult track will score 8 points. Second will get 4 and third will get 2. So we'll score each of these tracks individually right at the end of the game. A third way of consistent points are upgrades on your boards here. So if you upgrade your shovel ability, you will get six points each time you do this. Also with shipping, you will score two, three, and four points based on each rank that you go up. One of the primary ways of scoring, however, are these scoring tiles that come out along the left here. And each round will have a different objective to achieve. In the first round, it's asking us to make trading houses. And for each trading house that you produce during this round, you will score three points. In the second round, it's asking you to build strongholds and sanctuaries, which are your biggest buildings. And you will score five points for each of these that you build. And this one wants you to shovels, and you will get two points for each shovel used. This one, whenever you found a town, you get five. This one, every time you build just a dwelling, you'll get two points for each one. And it's the same one as before with the stronghold or sanctuary. So this is a really important factor and a big way of scoring points between rounds. There are two more ways of scoring points. Some of our bonus tiles that we'll get to pick each round will give you points based on what buildings you have out on the board. So this one will give you one point for every dwelling you had at the end of that round. And this one will give you four points for each stronghold or sanctuary you had at the end of that round. You can also unlock yourself favor tiles and these are like permanent upgrades. And three of these grant you a permanent way of gaining more points. So this one, every time you build a trading house, you gain three points. This time, every time you build a dwelling, you get two points. This one, you count how many trading houses on the game board and you'll get the number of points equal to how many you have. So we looked at all the ways that you can score points, but how does the game actually play? Well, the first screen you're going to get presented with is this screen here, and each player will take turns picking a faction. All factions are asymmetric, but I would recommend starting out with either the Nomads or Witches if it's your first game as these have more straightforward powers than the other ones and a bit more forgiving as well. So let's go into Nomads. And every faction has a home dwelling. So it will say here, you are playing Nomads on the desert spaces. Nomads home spaces are these deserts. They will need to terraform any other spot into a desert if they wish to settle on that location. Let's hit ready to start and I'll get into the teach. Let's have a look at the faction boards. So with the nomads, you can see this is your starting resources up here. So nomads give you 15 coins, they give you two workers, they give you one spot on the red and brown tracks on the cult tracks over here. And you can see the markers have automatically gone up because I've picked nomads and um, it's giving us all our starting resources immediately. Each faction also has a faction ability listed down in the bottom right hand corner. The Nomad's special power is that they get to start the game with three dwellings on the board rather than two. So normally each player will take turns putting out their starting dwellings on the board, which we're about to show you. And this is where you can start building from. So you need to start building adjacent to your dwellings to begin with. Each faction also has a special stronghold power, which will be listed here. They do all sorts of different things. So mouse over your stronghold when you get a chance and find out all about your power. So if I mouse over here, Board Game Arena will give us a um, brief overview of my power. So with the Nomad, I can terraform a spot adjacent to one of my locations and then immediately am eligible to build a dwelling on that spot. So this is a really good power and this is why it's one of the recommended factions to begin the game with. Let's go through and complete these dwelling placements. So my opponent's going to place one first. So you'll be asked which sand location you want to place on. That's because this is your home location. Something with dwelling placements is that you want to put yourself close to your opponents, but you also don't want to be blocked off by your opponent. The reason why you want to be close, I'll explain soon, but it's basically it gives you a discount on buildings and um, building up. And you really need to make every coin, worker, dollar count in this game to go do well. So I'm going to place my first dwelling there. I'm going to place the second one over here. 
predicting that the giant will place one here. And then because of my faction bonus, I get to place a third dwelling. Another thing you want to be thinking about when you're placing dwellings is how much does it cost to terraform the nearby places? So this little chart here shows you how many shovels you need to spend in order to turn one type of terrain into another type of terrain. So for the nomads, the brown and the mountain terrains only cost one shovel for them to convert. So if we look out to the board, this might be a good spot because there's a mountain here and there's a brown over here, but the giant will probably get to this before I can. There's a brown here, but not many mountains. This could be a nice four spot here. So let's go with that. Once all the players have placed all their dwellings, the last player in turn order will be asked to pick the first bonus card. These bonus cards will do various things. Um, anything with a hands in one knife like this will increase your income for that round and we will get an income on the first round. This will give me six additional coins in the first round. This one I explained earlier about getting bonus points for each dwelling at the end of the round. This shipping tile lets you build over rivers and you can also increase your shipping here. And this will allow you to access one tile over water. So this could build over here, or this could build over here. This can be increased to a total of three or four if you take this card on top of the three. This one will give you points for strongholds and give you two extra cubes, cubes are workers. And this one will increase your power income and give you a cube and I'll explain power soon. I'm gonna go ahead and select this tile here. So when it's your turn, the game will come up like this. It will highlight all the spots that you're able to access with a um, terrain change ability and this may increase based on your shipping rating. So but at the moment because I have zero shipping it's only showing all the places adjacent to my yellow buildings that I'm able to interact with including the yellow building itself. Let's come back down to the player board and I'll explain the buildings. So every one of your buildings has a cost in order to put out and this is listed down in the bottom left hand corner here. Most are straightforward, I'll explain the straightforward one. So dwellings cost one worker, two coins. Temples over here cost two workers, five coins, etc. So you can understand all of these. These trading houses, however, have two costs. They always cost two workers, but they either cost three coins or six coins. They cost three points if you are adjacent to a opposing player. So for me to build a trading house here, I'll get a discount because I have one of my opposing players adjacent to me. Buildings can only be built up in a certain order and there are very faint lines here um, indicating the order that they can be built. So dwellings can be turned into trading houses and trading houses only. Trading houses can either be turned into a stronghold or into temples and temples can be turned into the sanctuary over here. You're limited by components and every time you remove a component from your board your income will generally increase. So for every dwelling I'm putting on the board, I will generate extra workers every round. For every trading house I have on the board, I will generate coins and power, and this will go up in amounts based on how many I have. Strongholds give you access to your special power and sometimes have a power income or various income underneath. Look over here at the giant, they get slightly more power. So it's worth lifting these up and checking what's underneath. Temples are the ways that you can interact with cult tracks and get priests and also gain these favor tiles. So you can see this big large circle in the backdrop here. This means if you build any of the buildings touching the circle, which, which is the sanctuaries and temples, you will get one of these favor tiles. You can only have one of each of these favor tiles and I'll explain favor tiles more in a moment. Sanctuaries um, also give you a priest as income and they also have this special ability which lowers the requirements in order to found a town. I'll explain that when I get to founding towns. So first of all, let's show you how you can turn your dwelling into a trading house. If you click on it, up here will indicate the available options to you. So because I've um, dwellings can only be turned into trading houses, it will come up here and you can just hit confirm and this will automatically get swapped. My dwelling, when it comes off the board, actually goes back on the track here. So that income is now blocked again until I build a new dwelling. So managing your resources here is really important in Terra Mystica. Also, because I built a trading house on this round, I started on 20 score, and now my score is up to 23 because I scored three points because this was the bonus for this current round. 
Now it's asking me if I want to do conversion. So now might be a good time to explain the power pools. So over here, all players have these three pools of power. And power is like a wild resource that lets you interact with certain bonuses printed here on the board. And you can convert it into priests, workers, and coins based on this conversion right here. Five power for priests, three power for workers, and one power for one coin. However, power can only be spent when it's in pool number three. So this is one, this is two, and this is three. How do you get power into pool number three? Well, first, your power needs to all be emptied out of pool number one. So if I was to gain power, my power would go from pool number one into pool number two until pool number one was empty. Once pool number one is empty, pool number two will not then start filling into pool number three. As your power enters pool number three, it will be available to spend. As soon as you spend power from pool number three though, so let's say I spent four power and I wanted to interact with this. So this is the cost in power and this is the reward that you'll get. And these can be claimed once per round. So the first player to claim one of these will block it for all other players. So I let's say I really wanted to get these two workers. I would need to spend four power from pool number three and then put it back into pool number one. There is one more thing that you can do with power, which is this interaction just here called sacrifice power. And you might want to do this to lower the amount of power in your pools. Why is that a good thing? It's because your pools will rotate through faster based if it has less power in it. Another reason you want to sacrifice power is that it pushes a power from pool number two. It pushes one power from pool number two to pool number three and also destroys one power in pool number two. So let's do this three times. You can see free power has entered pool number three and I've also lost three more power in pool number two, leaving me with only two. So let's just go ahead and do this. So next turn I can show you how you can activate these powers. There are several ways of gaining power. There are the incomes that you'll get from here. So, and these hand symbols. So every time there's an arrow pointing to the right with a power icon, that is income. Arrow pointing to the left in black, that is spending from pool number three. These cult tracks, whenever you go past these uh, markers, these little walls on the cult track, you'll generate the number of power equal to inside this box here. If my marker went up to the free spot, I would generate one power from pool one to pool two. Another way of generate power, and the most interesting way, is that when opponents build buildings next to you, you also generate some power. Let's see how this works. The giant player is gonna build a trading house here. Let's just put that onto the board. And now you get something called power via structures pop up. And it says you may gain two power by losing one victory point. Why does that come up? Well, each row of these buildings here have a power rating. Dwellings are worth one, townhouses are worth two, and strongholds and sanctuaries are worth three. Because I have a trading house and that's on the two row here, and he only built to, next to one of my buildings, which was on this two row, I would generate two power. For every power you generate more than one, it will cost you one victory point less than the amount of power generated. So if I was to generate five power on my turn from this ability, it would cost me four victory points. How do you generate more power than three? If I had multiple buildings surrounding this building when he upgraded it. So if I was to have a stronghold in this location, that would be three. My trading house would be two. And because he built anything here, it would say you may gain five power by losing four victory points. I'm going to accept this and we'll see my power go from one to two. And my victory points have gone from 23 back down to 22. So this is why we start not on zero victory points. So you have the ability to use this ability early on in the game. Let's talk about now terraforming areas of the map. If I wanted to terraform this, for every shovel I need to terraform this location, which is one here, because there's one shovel between this brown location and this desert location, it will cost me three workers at the start of the game. That is because of this track here. You can see the three worker symbol pointing into one shovel. So for every shovel, it costs me three workers. I can upgrade this to be every worker is worth one shovel if I want to. To upgrade it, it costs you the amount of resources here. So this is two workers, five coins, and one priest. If I was to click on this, it will say transformation. 
cost you three and one shovel to turn this into sand. I can transform and build or just transform. Transform and build means as soon as you transform it into one of your home colors, you have the ability to build a dwelling if you have the required resources, which would be an additional one worker and two coins. If I wanted to convert this forest into my desert, or if I click on it, it will come up something like this. So I can decide which way around this wagon I want to build. And I'd pick, click on the sand and then it's going to tell me off because I don't have nine workers. I've only got six as here indicates. So just a little tutorial over here. Workers available, this is how many white cubes I have. This is how many coins I have. And this is my power in bowl one, power in bowl two and power in bowl three. And this is also how many priests I have available. So let's just pretend that we're going to build here. I will spend free one shovel and turn it into a sand. I'm going to say transform and build. So cost free plus one plus two. So it costs, it costs me four cubes and two coins to transform this into sand and build a dwelling. You may do conversions. This again is asking me if I want to, let's say, spend three of my power to turn free power into one cube. I ask you this at the end of your turn, just in case you have zero power and they're all in bowl number three gives you a chance to clear your bowl number three so if you generate more power in between turns it can cycle back around. Let's pretend I didn't want to use that shovel and spend those three cubes because I want to save them for buildings. I could spend my power in bowl three to do any one of these actions and I'll start from the right here. This one says get two spades and do the transform and build action. So this means I can terraform two different lands if I want or the same one, two spots around the board here and then build a dwelling. This one shovel, let's click on it. Let's pretend we're gonna spend four power. It should come out of bowl three to bowl one. And I can click on this and do the transform and build exactly like I did before. But instead of spending three cubes, I'm only spending four power from bowl three. This one simply spend four power to get seven coins, a slightly better conversion rate than spending one for one. So you get a bonus three coins using this. This one you can spend four power to get two cubes instead of spending three power to get one. So again, a better conversion rate. This is a way to get priests uh, immediately instead of waiting for your temples to generate them. This is how you can build bridges and bridges are important for founding towns because towns require you to have at least four buildings in adjacent to each other. And if you want to build a town over a river, you're going to need a bridge. And bridges can be placed in any of these hollow out bridged areas here. Let's jump into temples. So I'm going to build myself a temple this round. So I click on this and it will ask me which way I want to build this either up to a stronghold or across to a temple. I'm gonna say to a temple. It'll tell me the cost, which is this number here, two workers and five coins. And now, because I built a temple and this symbol was in the background, I get to choose one favor tile. These do a whole range of things and most I have explained already with the victory points. However, this will increase your power income. This will give you one power, one worker every round. This will let you um, place and do an action. So if you ever have this uh, orange bordered background, this is, consumes your action on a turn and it will let you go up on any one of the cult tracks every round and these get uncovered between rounds. This requires the total building power to be six instead of seven to form a town. I'll explain that immediately after this. This one simply increases your coin by three and you can see um, all of these favorite tokens have the cult tracks symbols on the left hand side. So this will make you go up on the cult track equal to the number of symbols listed there. And you might think why are the cult tracks so important, but they're definitely good for victory points. And you also get benefits in the cult tracks based on these scoring tiles here. So you don't only have this scoring side on the left, you're also on the right. For every four spot to up on the white cult track, you will get one shovel at, to use at the end of this round. And these all work in the same way. For every brown point you have on the brown cult track, you will get one coin at the end of this round. So maybe I will favor going towards the brown ones now so I can benefit from in rounds three and four from both of these abilities. Now I will talk about founding towns. To found a town, you need at least four adjacent buildings Adjacency does not cross over water unless you have a bridge. Once you have four buildings, you need the total cost of power in those buildings to be seven or more. Towns can be bigger than four buildings, that is important. And the, the power cost of each building is listed here. 
So to have a town here, I might want a temple, a stronghold, and two dwellings on these lands around here. And that would add to a total of seven. Once you hit seven, you will immediately be granted one of these keys to place on one of the town tiles. These will give you victory points in the top half. So this one gives you nine and immediately give you some resources at the bottom. This one gives you a priest. This one goes up, lets you go up on every single cult track one. This one gives you two workers. This one gives you eight power and this one gives you six coins. There are two copies of each of these in the game and this first in first served. These are placed underneath one of your buildings out on the board. It doesn't matter which one. Once you have founded a town, you can't found two towns using the same set of buildings. So you need to have a physical gap between your towns. So if I was to form a town, another town over here, that would be fine. But if I was to have six power worth of buildings along here, and then my seventh one would cause it to touch this town, it would not be classified as a town because it would just get included into this town's power amount. So that would then be 14 for this town. So you have to have distinct separate towns. Once you have placed that town tile on the board though, there is nothing stopping you from linking those two towns together and making them adjacent. When you have a priest in your stock, you are able to place it out on these cult tracks. And the number of spots you go up on the cult track is equal to this number here. So if I send my priest to this location, I would advance three cult spaces and lose the priest on the red track. When it says lose priest, it means it does not come back to your supply. So it will stay there forever as listed here in this helpful tip. And this is the total number of priests you have. You have a total of seven throughout the game. One other thing I didn't explain here is you can also convert priests into workers and workers can be converted into coins if need be. Once you've spent all the resources you want to spend in a round, you may want to save them between rounds. You don't lose any resources between rounds. You're going to want to take this pass action. This will mean that you will no longer be able to take actions this round. And the game will make you return your tile to this board here, available for someone else to pick, and ask you to pick one of the remaining tiles. Because my opponent's already passed, he has taken this tile, and he also returned this tile back to the track ready for me to pick. Tiles that weren't picked between rounds always get this coin each round between rounds to make it more juicy for people to pick. And let's grab this shipping one so I can help you explain shipping. So now that I have one shipping, you can see the game's highlighted a bunch more tiles. These are all tile spaces that are one shipping space away from my current buildings. So you can see this tile here can reach to all three of these because these are only over one water space. And this one can reach over to there and to here. There are two reasons why this is important. One, this is a good way to separate two towns by getting them um, not adjacent anymore. So you can start build working on more towns throughout the game. Another right reason why shipping is so important is at the end of the game, we're going to be doing this area scoring, counting up the number of structures that you have connected. So what that means is at the moment I have only one and it will show it up here how many structures connectors I have. For structures to be connected, they need to be either directly adjacent to each other or be reachable by your shipping. If I had this desert space taken, I would need two shipping in order to link it to this. And then it'll bounce two more, so I could have it one here, and then two more I could have one here. And all of these locations would be considered connected for this scoring, if that was the case. The game will continue until all of these tiles have been used, so we've played six rounds. And at the end of the six rounds, we will then score for area, cults, and leftover resources. All of your resources in the game will get converted into coins as able, convert coins three to one for victory points. So if I have 15 coins at the end of the game, I would then score five points as well. Check who has the highest score and that person is the winner. I hope you found this tutorial helpful and please like and subscribe to Let's Start Playing. If you did, hopefully I'll see you for the next video. Thanks for watching.